my own research, uh, if I can confess, uh, has very little to do with China in Europe, uh, which is the theme of this workshop. Um, so the question for me is how can I contribute to the debate of China's soft power in context with particular reference to China in Europe? Uh, that's why I come up with this kind of uh, rather, uh, how do I put it, uh, catchy title, China's soft power in Europe, a historical and philosophical reflection, which gives me a little bit of space to talk about what I want to talk, uh, rather than focusing, focusing on a particular issue and, and a particular period of, of, of um, uh, China in Europe or Sino-European relations. Now, from the title itself, you probably could get that my presentation here will be somewhat different from the earlier presentations that I have actually uh, sort of uh, heard uh, at this conference. The first difference, if I can you know, sort of uh, uh, elaborate a little bit, is uh, I'm not talking about China as a state or as a China kind of uh, economic model or even China's kind of elite uh, business elite uh, networks. Uh, I'm talking about China as an idea or a bundle of ideas. And secondly, my focus will very much on cultural and intellectual encounters between Europe and China, either collectively or individually or both. And thirdly, uh, the historical period I'm going to look at uh, is very different, the historical context. Uh, I'll be actually tracing back to the first encounter between the two civilizations, that is the European civilization and Chinese civilization, and to see how historically uh, soft power uh, played a very important role in defining both China and the European modernity. Um, so uh, if there is any uh, modest purpose of my presentation, uh, that is to contextualize our understanding of China's soft power in Europe in deep intellectual history. So that is really uh, the purpose. Uh, and the rest of the presentation is actually much more banal if you like. I'm going to tell two stories. Uh, one is a long story, the other is a short story. Now the long story, I'm sure many of you here uh, will be more or less familiar, uh, but I'll put a spin, a soft power spin on it so that to make it more relevant to the conference theme. And then I go, I'm going to to tell a short story, uh, which I think uh, you'll be, probably many of you will be surprised to see how uh, Chinese uh, soft power plays uh, in the mind of some European philosophers uh, in the 20th century. Okay, let me start with this long story. Uh, a long story, uh, as I mentioned, uh, more or less familiar to the audience here. Uh, of course, the long story starts in the early 16th century when the first Portuguese traders navigated around South China Sea and landed on the coast of Canton. Uh, that is what we know Guangzhou here. And they were soon followed by European missionaries. Now, this is very important because it is their arrival in the Middle Kingdom in the, at the beginning of this uh, uh, 16th century that established for the first time in world history, direct and substantive cultural, societal and civilizational encounters between Europe and China. It made diffusion and circulation of ideas between two great civilization, civilizational centers at two extreme ends of the Euro-Asian continent possible and mutually enriching. Now, as early as 1579, Jean Baudin wrote, I quote, 
The Spanish have remarked that the Chinese, the most oriental of peoples, are the most ingenious and most courteous, and that of those of Brazil, the most occidental, are the most barbarous and cruel. The European outwards had discovered, quote, quote, unquote, China. That is, for the first time, Europe became fully aware of the existence of a great civilization with its own tradition and religion. That is more ancient than that of Europe and owed little to Europe. That discovery had a powerful effect in Europe. Now, let me give you two examples. One is in the 17th century, the other is in the 18th century. Now, in the 17th century, it provoked theological controversies in Europe. To start with, it led to debates over the dating of biblical events. Ancient Chinese records were simply too difficult to square with the biblical chronology. It also mounted a powerful challenge to the uncontested supremacy of Christianity. Uh, Louis Lecon, a prominent French Jesuit, for example, provoked a furious debate when he made a controversial claim in a publication in 1696. Let me quote uh, one very short quote from uh, that publication. The people of China had preserved for about 2,000 years of knowledge of the true God and have honored him in such a manner as to serve as an example and model even for Christians. This particular claim and other polemics led to weeks of debates at the theor uh, theological faculty of the Sorbonne in 1700 on the Chinese rites. The theological disputes in those debates are in part actually about the challenges posed by the Chinese history, culture, and religious practices as represented in the Jesuit text to the exclusive hegemony of Christian doctrine. The other example, in the 18th century, we have this metaphysical contact between China and Europe, mostly dominated by philosophical debates. China's presence in Europe at the time simply was simply like a phantom. Ancient Chinese religion and philosophy found their way into the works of such important Enlightenment thinkers as Leibniz, Voltaire, Kine, and Bell, among others, thanks mostly to Jesuit's writing and nascent Sinology in Europe. Influence of Confucianism was found in the arguments for religious tolerance, in their attempts to relativizing Christianity, in their advocate of reason, and in their attack on religious fanaticism in the philosophical spirit. Now, let me give you one example. I mean, I think many of us probably know, uh, of course, uh, Voltaire is a Sanofil. Voltaire claimed, for example, that the French philosophers, I quote, discovered there in China a new moral and physical universe, unquote. And he called China, I quote again, the wisest empire in the universe, unquote. Voltaire is often regarded as an enlightenment thinker who transformed China, a quote again, into a political utopia and ideal state of an enlightened absolutism and who held up the mirror of China to provoke self-critical reflection among European monarchs. For both Voltaire and Kine, China was unmistakably elevated as a model for the social and political reforms they advocated in France. 
the great Oriental empire, that is China, became, let me quote another historian, I quote, a whip in the hands of the reformers with which to beat Ancien regime. Now, European philosophers, of course, have also different perceptions and contrasting images of China then as now. That is why it's very interesting just to hear the debates earlier about how China has been perceived in Europe today. So it will be remiss if I don't mention some of those, let's call it negative uh, images or perceptions of China uh, then. Well before enlightenment, Francis Bacon, for example, had looked at China as a, a quote, a curious, ignorant, fearful, and foolish nation. In spite of his admiration for Chinese language and also for Montesquieu, in his uh, in the spirit of the laws, uh, Montesquieu developed a concept of oriental despotism and described the Chinese state as an exemplar of corrupted tyrant. For Kondashi, China belonged to the third epoch of human history with, with its agriculture-based economy and society. And the Chinese were condemned to, I quote, a shameful immobility and eternal mediocrity. Now, let me end this long story by quoting a prominent uh, Oxford historian, Geoffrey Hudson, who wrote in 1965 that in the 18th century, China was, in his words, I quote, a great power culturally in Paris than was Europe in Peking. Old China reached out and cast a spell over its future conqueror, leaving indelible traces in the cultural tradition of Europe." Unquote. Now, indelible traces, uh, can be otherwise found in popular culture in Europe, uh, embodied, for example, in the so-called chinoiserie and also in variety of fine porcelain designs and picturesque wallpapers in Europe even today. I think earlier in Magna's presentation, he also gave us a very classical example of Chinese influence in the popular culture in Europe. Now, it is such a rage of things Chinese that actually launched the so-called gradual conscious revolt against neoclassical standards in the, 18, uh, in the 18th century. Now, let me turn to my short story. Uh, as I mentioned, this story would probably be a, a somewhat a surprise to many of us here, uh, you know, how the Chinese sought power Chinese influence uh, can be found in uh, the 20th century uh, uh, European philosophers. So if I bring this story back to the 20th century, uh, this is about a French philosopher, again, uh, no other than Foucault. More specifically, let me refer to his very influential book, The Order of Things and archaeology of the human sciences. Now, many of us may have already read that book or at least have encountered that book, if, I mean, if not read it in full. But how many of us actually are aware that the whole book is inspired by Foucault's rather brief and probably his only brush with what he, he called uh, Chinese ideas? Now, Foucault acknowledged this loudly, and one might could say, uh, uh, and one could say, amusing in the preface to that book. Now, this is found very much in the opening paragraph 
of the preface to the book. Therefore, it is worth quoting in full. Now, let me just read it out. You have to bear with me because it's a rather long quote. The book first arose out of a passage in Bodge, out of the laughter that shattered as I read the passage, all the familiar landmarks of my thought, our thought, the thought that bears the stamp of our age and our geography, breaking up all the ordered surfaces and all the plans with which we are accustomed to tame the wild confusion of existing things and continuing long afterwards to disturb and threaten with collapse our age old distinction between the same and the other. This passage quotes, this is the quote, a certain Chinese encyclopedia in which it is written that, uh, this is the quote, animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, sucking pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a very fine cam camel hair brush, L, etc. M, having just broken the water pitcher, N, that form a long way off look like flies. In the wonderment of this taxonomy, the thing we apprehend in one great leap, the thing that by means of the fable is demonstrated as the exotic charm of another system of thought, is the limitation of our own, the stark impossibility of thinking that. Now, of course, Foucault is not easy to read. Uh, I mean, translation is probably more difficult uh, when, uh, when in, in English, but he has made the point very clear. Foucault then moved on and note that at the other extremity of the earth, we inhibit was located, he quote, uh, I quote again, a culture entirely devoted to the ordering of the space, but one that does not distribute multiplicity of the existing things into any of the categories that make it possible for us to name, speak, and think." Unquote. Clearly, Foucault here was experiencing some kind of epistemological crisis, if only transient but also a strong sense of emancipation in this brief encounter with the Chinese ideas of order. Not only could cultures be arranged completely differently, yet remain somehow inherently consistent and coherent, but the other system of thought has also exposed the limits of our own while, exhi while exhibiting its exotic charm. The knowledge system that Foucault was familiar with, which is shattered, as he said, with an outburst of laughter, looks more like a local phenomenon rather than a global destiny. The schema of cultural perception and interpretation, which Foucault has had trusted so far and for so long, would have been broken down irremediably in certain specific ways. I'm co-quoting a philosopher's reflection on this. It is such an experience of crisis and em emancipation that provided inspiration for Foucault to construct a new narrative in the order of things in order to, in his own words, uncover the deepest strata of Western culture. 
Now, this will be the end of my storytelling. But there are two questions that remain unanswered by this storytelling. The first one must be familiar with all of you. This is the so what question, because we ask our students so many so often about, okay, you tell me the story, you told me so, so and so, and so what? The so what question, you know, those two stories. The second one, more specifically, related to uh, particularly the theme of this workshop. That is, how can these stories help contextualize our understanding of the calling question of this workshop? That is, what is the most recent dynamic between Europe and China in matters of perceptions and soft power? So I think I'll leave those two unanswered questions for our discussion and uh, question and answers. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chang. Um, uh, very fascinating. And uh, uh, actually, I'm very happy that we can round off uh, today's